what is your life? The Bible says, what is your life? And uh, I'm, I'm preaching to myself. I'm preaching largely out of personal experience. But I'm smart enough to know that it's a common salvation and it applies to others. Right? Paul said to Timothy, you preach the word and teach the people of God what you've learned and you'll both save yourself and them that hear you. All right. So what is your life? It is a vapor that appears for a moment and vanishes away. So it's this eternal perspective that we're cultivating which so easily slips away in the uh, day-to-day drudgery of life, the treadmill of life, you know. And it's very easy in a, uh, in a uh, I don't know, for me in a lifestyle of a motel maintenance where there's always issues and there's always calls to be continuously consumed in the attention and occupation of these carnal things. And that's the main uh, that's the main battle in the mind, right? It's the constant distraction. It's not so much the nefarious or the uh, being that. It's not so much uh, I'm a willingly deceitful, nefarious person and sinister and doing all kinds of wicked, evil things and thinking poorly of my brethren and my fellow man. And uh, though I'm I'm pretty good with that at uh, those atti- attitude things. I, you know, I don't have a whole lot of that. It's the distraction stuff. And that's why I started talking about neglect last week. So, um, so again, speaking from personal experience, a lot of what trips me up in my mind would be either choked out by the cares of life, and when you get choked out by the cares of life, you pay too much attention, or you ascribe, let's say you ascribe too much importance. I'll say it that way. Ascribe too much importance to the things of this life. So I'll say it for myself and everyone else. What is your life? What is your life? Just a vapor. How significant is your life? <laughs> Nothing. Yeah, not judgment. And so we get all worked up over, oh, I didn't make as much money on this job as I could have, and this uh, obstruction happened, and I wasn't counting on this, oh, and I didn't price the job for that, and uh, I could get in a big tizzy over that. But uh, and think, oh, well, I'm doing this job in vain, but then who cares? Right, as long as I'm not trying to be deceitful and everything else, well, I'll just learn a lesson from it. And of course, the other thing about Christianity is that uh, most Christians today are not um, really focused on what really constitutes true Christianity. Remember, Christianity is not a service to humanity. A lot of people uh, borrow a, a worldly, a sort of a life philosophy. And they, they take it off of a scriptural principle, uh, the golden rule, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And uh, you can really generalize that principle and base your whole life on it and not necessarily be a devout Christian with an eternal perspective, aware of their own depravity and, and diligently working out their salvation. So it's, it's, it's not a just do unto others. The two great commandments are, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind, all thy strength. The second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor even as yourself. Now, first of all, the Bible goes further to define who is my neighbor. Who is my neighbor? If you're familiar with the, the story in Luke, a certain man went from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves and they left him for dead and uh, a man walked and passed by, and a Levite passed by on the other side, and so on. But a Samaritan came and poured in oil and wine and tended to him and healed him of his wounds and put him on an ass and sent him on his way. And Okay, so which, which of these was the neighbor? Well, the one who, who helped him out. But the neighbor was not any man, it was a certain man. Yeah. And the certain man was started in Jerusalem and went down to Jericho. So again, we have an allegory. A, a, a story which is in the form of an allegory revealing something spiritual. Not something carnal, but something spiritual. Jerusalem, uh, for us, Jerusalem is the spiritual Jerusalem. But you are come unto the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city. If you can receive it in the spiritual sense, we are now, right now, we are in new Jerusalem. Because we are assembled together. It's a spiritual city. It's not a physical one right now. It's a spiritual one. And uh, we have come into the... Uh, 
presence of an innumerable host of angels, and uh, we've come to Jesus Christ Himself because we're two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst. That's just stop, let it sink in for a while. Jesus Christ is right here. He's walking around and He's uh, taking inventory of what we're doing and thinking and saying, and uh, He's here. <laughs> well, that takes, a, that takes a measure of faith to be aware of that. And then to uh, have this, have the, uh, the the response that he is here, the, whatever the sense of fear and awe and carefulness and and uh, the uh, or the being impressed with it, let's say, just being impressed with it. So, what is your life like? How important is it? What you accomplish, what you do, uh, you know, he who seeks to save his life shall lose it, and who he loses his life. Ne- never gets a career, never accomplishes anything, never again, his business never prospers. He doesn't, you know, what, what have you done with your life? No, get a life. No, the Bible says lose a life. <laughs> you see how the world looks at it, right? It's just uh, opposite. So uh, I'll go into a few things here. Um, I, I, I'm saying this to comfort myself because I get discouraged at the way things go. And my only way out, my only way out is, is, is to just force my mind, take my thoughts captive and say, it just isn't that important. It really doesn't matter. So what if you lose $1,000 or two? What if they take all the money out of your bank account? What of this? What of that? I don't care. I don't care. So... Again, let's go back to what I was saying. Christianity is not just a service to humanity. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Your neighbor is your Christian brother. Because he starts in Jerusalem, the spiritual city. We're in Jerusalem, right? So you're, you're my brothers. I'm your brother. Here we are. We're in Jerusalem. Well, what happens if tomorrow I backslide, fall away from, from the standard that I've been living in? I, I backslide. And I become worldly and I get tangled up and the world uses me and abuses me and leaves me half for dead. See, I'm, I'm, I'm a certain man. I'm starting in Jerusalem. I'm starting in a spiritual condition. And I'm ending up in Jericho. Well, look at the Bible and the story of Jericho. Jericho was an evil city. It was a wicked city. It was a, the walled city. And they conquered the city by marching around the walls of Jericho and blowing the trumpet. And you know what happened on the seventh day. They march sometimes, they blow the trumpet, and the walls fall, and they burn the city with fire. And Rahab the harlot's in there with the scarlet thread, all of that. So you're looking, and I'm not going to get into the details of that allegory or imagery, but a certain man goes from Jerusalem to Jericho. It would be like us, starting off spiritual and backsliding and becoming carnal and entangled and suffering and... Uh, wounds and spiritually as a result. So, so who is my neighbor? For the Christian, your neighbor isn't the guy that lives at 132 something street and I live at 130 something street and so he lives next door to me so he's my neighbor. Spiritually speaking, the, your neighbor is your brother, your Christian brother. Now, I'm not saying you can't love your carnal neighbor as yourself. You can, you can extend it to him too. And there, there's good things we do to people who aren't saved. The Bible makes provision and instruction for that. Yes. You, if you have opportunity, do good to all men, but especially those that are the household of faith. Right. But we're supposed to prioritize our brethren, right? But the, uh, the parable of the certain man who went to Jerusalem to Jericho is an allegory about a Christian who falls back and backslides and his brother helps him to recover. So what I'm saying is uh, the world trying to practice the golden rule, well, lots of people say do unto others as you would have them do to you, and it's a good principle. I'm not opposed to the principle, but as Christians, we always got to leave off the principles and take it to perfection. We're not going to get by just on principles. We have to learn to go on to perfection, but it starts with the principles. But here's the thing. Lots of people practice the golden rule, but they don't love God with all the heart, soul, mind and strength. So it's it's like the second commandment at the expense of the first one. So then what happens is you end up worshiping and serving the creature more than the creator. You know, the the, the atheist can have a, a philosophy of life that says, well, I should try to treat my fellow man the way I would like to be treated. And maybe he doesn't believe in God, but maybe he believes in karma or some other... <laughs> So he says, well, you know, I should treat this guy 
good because I'd like to be treated good. And he doesn't necessarily believe in God. He's not working out his salvation. He's not loving the Lord with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. Serving the creature more than the creator. And so the United States has become the uh, um, sort of the fountainhead of certain things. Uh, one is it, it became the, uh, kind of the fountainhead of, of evangelical outreach in the last hundred years because you, you, you know if we know about the church history in 1906 and the Azusa Street Revival, what they call the latter reign, a great outpouring of the Spirit, a restoration to a pronounced um, prominence and demonstration of the supernatural gifts of the Holy Ghost, and all that happened until around 1960 or so, and probably William Branham was like the, bat, the last high-profile kind of uh, demonstrator, manifester of the uh, gifts of the Spirit in, in a pronounced supernatural way. And we say, we've heard Brother Stair say, we've heard other people say, what, what did that accomplish? What did that accomplish for the perfection of the church? The, the whole thing started very very much in humility and faith and, and with charity and devotion to, towards God in 1906. And it was very much spontaneous. It was a work of God. It's something that God did. And it was very dramatic. It was very noteworthy. And it was a, a great blessing. But as we know, what happened is men began to organize it. It just fell out into more different organizations, Pentecostal denominations, everything else. And for all the, the uh, tremendous degree of supernatural demonstration poured out between 1906 and the mid-60s or whatever, did it accomplish to bring unity of the church or, or, or a perfected people living in purity and holiness? On the contrary, it, it finally degenerated into the prosperity stuff. And a bunch of emphasis on miracles and nothing on perfection. Yeah. You know, ten, clep, ten lepers were cleansed. That's a set of supernatural healing. Ten of them were cleansed. And they went and only one turned around and cried with a loud voice. And Jesus says, is there only this one that turned around to give thanks? Right. I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. That doesn't mean that they all follow through onto salvation. And so we always drag our minds and come on back to the, the eternal perspective. What is life? What is your life? And what is my life? And what is life? And what are we supposed to do in life? And everything about the Christian that can be about the purpose of the Christian life, if you want to get utterly simple, you can summarize it in a single word. A single word. Preparation. Preparation. Prepare to meet thy God. That's it. That's what this life is. It's not to be notable, not to get rich, not to leave your mark or accomplish something or pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of my happiness. And I'll talk more about that later. You know, I, I touch on that every once in a while. And I'm going to review it again. No, in a nutshell, in total simplicity, we are a we are in a world. We were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. The sentence of death is on us. The sentence of death is on the world. In science and physics, you have the law of entropy. Everything is breaking down, decaying. Everything left to itself breaks down, not by nature, into more randomness, disc. De decay, disorder, and death. That is, that is a fundamental, universal, well-known, established, empirical law of physics that man knows. So that's fundamental. You know, that's why I'm so, that's why I'm, real Christians are not evolutionists. You know, if evolution, evolution says everything left to itself accumulates into more complexity and just come, builds itself into more order and more diversity, more complexity, more detail, more structure, and more order. Well, that's not true in the laws of nature. And the laws of nature were made by God because the worlds were framed by the Word of God. So those laws of nature should tell us something about the spiritual laws or the spiritual purpose, let's say, the spiritual purpose. And that's because when Adam ate the fruit and, and, and they obeyed the serpent who represents the devil, up until that time, Adam and Eve had dominion. But when they submitted to the counsel of the serpent, they, they surrendered their authority to the serpent and the devil became the god of this world. 
And then sin entered into the world, not just into Adam and Eve. Sin entered into the world, into the physical structure, into the animal kingdom. It entered into the world. That's why you have animals like lions and every they're carnivores and they kill each other and eat each other up and it's all gruesome and violent and, and trying to maintain their life. Well, when Jesus comes and the devil's bound for a thousand years and sin isn't in the world anymore, the lion lies down with the lamb. The lion eats, ax, uh, eats grass like an ox. This carnivore nature of, of the animal kingdom is because of sin. It's not going to be around when Jesus comes back. So sin entered into the whole world. That means we're, we come, we, we arrive in a world of sin, on a world being destroyed with no hope of redemption. The world can't be saved. You have to be saved out of it. And that should be the only important thing in your conscience. For your whole life. That should be the only ultimate important thing for you by which you gauge everything you do in life. Because that's the only important thing. If I don't prepare to meet God, I'm going to miss it. Yeah. And the knowledge of God is always promoting the fear of God. And it's the fear of God that moves you to work out your salvation. Everything with God starts with fear. It doesn't start with kindness or gentleness or love or anything like that. Although we should follow through to know all those things, the love of God, the kindness of God, the mercy of God. I'm not discounting it, but I'm saying our starting point, our starting point is fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Right? Noah moved with fear. fear. He prepared the ark to the saving of his house. Prepare to meet your God. Strive to enter in. Give diligence. Many will seek to enter and shall not be able to, and we can go on and on. See, these are all fear-promoting counsels, but not on godly fear. Uh, godly fear, not ungodly fear. Fear that causes you to acknowledge the, uh, the utter importance, the necessity, the gravity, the weightiness of what's upon us here. And that's why real preachers... We're, we're, God, God isn't trying to save a country or, or anything like that. God, God isn't going to restore America or anything like that. Because the world has its death sentence on it. And we have a death sentence. Paul said we have the sentence of death written on us. Every time we know how much of a failure or how far we fall short, we miss the standard or and anything else, or we look back and see how we may have missed the will of God or failed God or uh, slipped and stumbled or anything else, and anything we have suffered as a result of our own sin and transgression and neglect, and we suffer as a result, and don't make any mistake about it, you sow and you reap, and the Bible says every transgression will receive a just recompense, and so you suffer when you sin, and through the suffering, you're supposed to learn something. And the captain of our salvation, Jesus, he was made perfect through sufferings. Even though he didn't sin, he was made perfect through sufferings because he had to go through the same thing that we go through. We're made perfect through sufferings. But he had to go through sufferings to make per be made perfect so he could relate to us and help us and you know, encourage us in a way that we would be convinced that he, he knows how we feel. Right? Now, how, how would we be convinced that Jesus knows how we feel if, if we had to suffer, but he didn't? Then we could just say, well, how do you know? You didn't have to suffer. Right? We could hold the charge up on He said, oh, no, I had to suffer. I learned obedience by the things I suffered. So we go back to this fundamentals. Through much tribulation, you enter the kingdom of God. That's why we're against the pre-tribulation rapture. The pre-tribulation rapture is fundamentally opposed to the most basic, basic, fundamental tenets of Christianity. For a Christian to be made perfect, he's going to have to learn through his sufferings and there's no other way. So, going back to our lives, what's our life? Yeah, And I'll just say myself, I just, I'm just i ascribing way too much importance to events and things of this life. If, if, I, if, if you can win that battle, now I'm not saying uh, don't be irresponsible at your job or don't be irresponsible at the the sort of the uh, responsibilities that God gives you for sort of daily living. We all have that. It, I'm not saying be so nonchalant about your daily life that you don't do anything. You just sit around and 
right? Never cook the meals, never cut the grass, never work, never do anything. Man doesn't work, neither should he eat. I guess you should work, right? A man should work. But there's a, a balance there. But in general, we ascribe far too much importance to the things of this life, and therefore when they don't work out the way we're hoping or the way we're expecting, uh, our reaction is severe because we're placing a lot of importance upon it. It's not all that important. All is vanity. All is vanity and vexation of spirit in this life. If you look only in this life. If we have hope only in Christ in this life. If we have hope only in this life in Christ. We are of all men most miserable. People are expecting things from God. People think uh, they're expecting things from God in a certain way at a certain time. And even though we know certain ways about the patterns and principles and, and the method of God's salvation, we know about the common salvation. We know the pattern of salvation. We know it's a baptism of, of suffering and tribulation. We know that God also will succor us and encourage us and bless us uh, along the way to strengthen us. And we kind of go through this cycle of ups and downs and everything else. Even We know all that, yet in particular, in the, in the details of what God is doing, we, we don't know that. That's, that. that's Who knows? Who knows the, the hidden deep things God does and why things go all, all the way they do and all in the sequence that they do and why things don't come the way we want to and everything else. And that's why I was preaching a couple of weeks ago against the instant mentality. This is an instant generation. And the supernatural uh, manifestation of the Holy Ghost with all these instant healings and instant miracles you got to watch that you don't develop a sort of an, uh, an, an instant mentality that you think God has to do everything for you instantly. If that were the case, then what does the trial of your faith mean? There is no trial of your faith. The Bible said more important than your healing, more precious than your actual healing is the trial of your faith. God testing you, making you wait to see if you'll stay faithful and trust Him to provide what you're asking Him for. Praise God. Hebrews chapter 11 says, These all died in faith, not receiving the promise. Amen. Yeah. So I ask God for some healing and I don't get healed? Is it God's fault? Is it my fault? Does that mean God hates me? Not at all. Not necessarily. What does it mean? It means you're blessed because God's got you on trial. Yeah. It means He sees some faith. He said, Hey, I see some faith there. I can try it. I can test it. I can let Him wait for a while. We're not those who are slothful, the Bible says in Hebrews, but we're a followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. The promise is my inheritance. We're talking about this on the porch the other day. Hey, I, if I have a rich father and he leaves me a million dollars and then all of a sudden one day my, my father dies and I, I get a letter in the mail that uh, your father left you a million dollars in his will. You have inherited a million dollars. And so I rush out the door and go down to the car lot and I buy a fancy Corvette and they say, well, that'll be $60,000. And I say, well, uh, and there's no money in my bank. My credit limit's too low. Yeah, yeah, I don't know, but, but, but I'm a millionaire. Well, right, I'm an, I've inherited a million dollars, right? It hasn't manifested yet, has it? Has it? Because there's a court proceedings and they got to go through all the... Uh, bureaucracy and they have to make it official and it's got to go through all this process and then that has to finally be cleared by the courts and then they have to put it into my bank and if maybe they'll remove something for inheritance tax and but all this stuff has to happen okay so yeah by a stripes you're healed well, but, but you're not healed well you have maybe have a trial of faith maybe you need patience maybe through faith and patience eventually you Inherit the promise. Because we went through this, I went through this in my early days in Christianity with fringe non-denominational groups who emphasized the manifestation of the Holy Ghost and healing and everything. And there's no problem emphasizing divine healing. Jesus Christ paid for your healing. The atonement has everything to do with your, with your spirit, soul, and body. Right? Forgiveness of sins and physical healings Jesus made no distinction between the two. He didn't separate the two. He said, what's easier to say? Your sins be forgiven or be healed and rise up and take up your bed. Doesn't matter. I could do it either way because it's all a package deal in the atonement. 
Jesus said, it's finished. It's all done. I paid the price. God's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. It's all done. There's nothing more God has to do to make that happen. Sometimes we're subject to faith, patience, for our healings, for our deliverances. And this is the deeper part of God's purpose. For every single one of us, God knows exactly the detailed plan that He has to purge us and prepare us for eternal life, heal us, deliver us, whatever. So what if you go your whole life and you don't receive the promise like Abraham? Or like the people in Hebrews chapter 11. Ne- they didn't never receive the pro- never receive the promise in this life, right. Right. and that's why I say receiving the promise or some manifestation of healing in your flesh is not the issue with God. The issue is, do you have faith? Are you trusting Him? Absolutely. Are you enduring? Do you have patience? Absolutely. And if you do, but uh, but I'll take it a step further. Okay, those were the guys in the Old Testament. God's Bible says in Hebrews, God provided some better thing for us. So we're going to see some of the manifestation right. of our faith in this life. That's right. We are going to see healings in this life. Yes. Manifestations. Amen. But, we, well, well, you know, are we going to see it all? Well, when we die, we will. Some people die in faith. Anne died in faith. She didn't get any physical healing that we saw. And yet, yet when she passed on, she was free. Absolutely. Right? She is free of her cancer. Yes. She was delivered. So what's the issue? What was the important thing? Her dying in the faith, Absolutely. not receiving the promise. So that's the key. So too much, too much emphasis on the on the supernatural and the instant takes away the heart of 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 willing to be tried, willing to have patience, willing to endure. Although the fig tree does not blossom, although the uh, be no calves in the stall. The labor, of the, the labor of the olive fails. Everything that God promised me about prosperity, it just doesn't seem to be so. Yet I will glory in the God of my salvation. David said, yeah, God promised me this, that, and the other thing, and the blessing, and he says, although it be not so with my house, even though I don't see it, seems like it's yet... Right? Yet I have a covenant. I have a steadfast. yeah covenant with God, steadfast and sure, and all things. Faith and faith. Our faith is always based not on the things of this life. Remember, all faith has to be traceable. All faith somehow has to come back to faith in the resurrection. When when Paul was disputing with religious people when he was contending and disputing, when he was suffering persecution because of the things he was preaching. It all had to do with Jesus Christ, number one, but not just Jesus, but the fact that he rose from the dead. He says to the council there, so in the hope of the resurrection of the dead, am I called into question this day? Our faith has to always, if we're to have, and I think I said something similar to this in the previous week or two, But if we're ever to have the strength to have patience and endure things, it's because we, it's going to be because we believe God can raise us from the dead. Now, on a uh, level, on the level of this life, I might put my hope in something. I might put my hope that I can go to a job so that I can make some money and uh, help my brother or what have you. And then my hope is dashed. Uh, I price the job wrong and I make mistakes and uh, I can't make any money on this job. So my hope dies. Okay, I suffer a death. Remember Paul, he said, I I die daily. I have expectations that that are thwarted and, and don't come, that are spoiled. Things I wished happened, hope would happen. Want it to happen. I have things like that that are spoiled and upset and overthrown every day. Every day I die. Every day my expectation, my hopes, the things that I would like, and they're overthrown or disappointed or not realized. I die daily. You don't know what a day brings forth. Now, not all your hopes are going to be dashed. And God can help you uh, realize and achieve certain hopes in this life, uh, certain ones, 
The Bible says that you have hope in this life in Christ only, only in this life. Your hope in Christ has to go to the eternal. So if I have a hope in this life that's overthrown, cast down, what's my hope? My hope now becomes that God will replace that hope and give me another hope. He'll resurrect me in another hope. So it's a kind of an inner resurrection based on, not on physical resurrection, but resurrection of hope, resurrection of purpose in life. I go through that, and the more I get exercised in that, the more I become convinced that God will also raise me from the dead. Now, when we die physically, dying in the faith physically requires that you believe God will physically raise you from the dead. Absolutely. And that's what I was saying about John chapter 6. Except you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. And oh, we can't receive this thing. You know, and that represents, eating the flesh, drinking the blood represents walking in tribulation, walking in the sufferings of Christ. And when you walk in the sufferings of Christ, you lose. You lose your life. You lose your expectation. You lose your hope of what you hoped would happen, wanted to happen. You're going to lose. But you'll win eternal life, right? So if you're going to lose, how could anybody be willing to lose unless they hope in a resurrection? Whether it's a resurrection of hope within your spirit for what you're going to do the rest of your life, or whether it's the actual hope of bodily, physical resurrection. And you're exercising God, renewing you in hope and resurrecting your hopes for the things of this life, prepares you and waxes you more and more confident that God can also raise you from the dead physically. But Jesus said to those people in John chapter 6, you don't want to eat the flesh and drink the blood or you don't want to walk in the fellowship of your sufferings and suffer loss, the loss of your life, the loss of your hopes, your dreams, your ambitions. He said, what if you see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? What if you see resurrection, in other words? See, he's he's alluding to the resurrection there. Your inability to take the hardness as a good soldier of Christ, your inability or reluctance to walk in the fellowship of his sufferings because you don't have strength, the faith, the, the strength of your faith is not in the resurrection. If you truly believed in resurrection power, you'd be willing to take the sufferings, you'd be willing to suffer the loss. And, and let me put it in a practical sense. Which of you, by taking thought, having effort, which of you, by striving and trying to labor to increase your financial status, which of you, by taking any thought, the Bible says take no thought, no thought, what you eat, what you drink, wherewithal you'll be clothed, the provisions of this life, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. God will add all these things. Look at the sparrows. They don't sow. They don't have barns. They don't lay up in store. They just fly around and wherever they find food, they find it. God provides for them. And you're you're more important than the sparrow. So which of you by taking thought? That's what the Bible says. Labor not to be rich. Now if riches increase, riches may increase. You You can have riches increase and you didn't lift a finger to try to get them. Because God says, okay, there's a man who's not covetous, he's doesn't, not moved by riches, so I can give him riches, his heart won't be taken with it, and then he can d- distribute to the yeah. brothers who have need. Absolutely. Praise but you see, he didn't, he didn't uh, strive for it, he didn't you know, labor for it. Okay, uh, and so the Bible says also, give me neither poverty nor riches, give me such things as are convenient for me, don't give me poverty, lest I desperate and I steal and take the name of the Lord in vain, and don't give me riches, lest I, riches, I learn to trust in the riches and I forget who the Lord is. Keep me in that kind of balance. I, I go to a job, right? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to its sta- to a stature? You have a status that God ordained. God ordained it. He called the measure and the height or the lowliness or the loftiness of your stature. Your bestowments financially, intellectually, spiritually. God set that standard. God ordained you to have a certain stature. And if you change it or you try to change it, God will just pull you right back to that stature that He said 
you're going to have. Right? And that's just the way it is. Oh, grant that these two sons may sit, one in your right hand, one in your left. Another, give me a stature. Let us have the high cubit of stature. Let me sit on the right hand of the Lord and on the left. We want to have the high place of glory. And you know what Jesus says, you don't know what you ask. Can you eat, drink the cup I drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? Because you want a higher stature, you have a greater degree of suffering to get there. Oh yeah, Lord, we're able. He said, okay, yeah, and you will. And we are able. We're able to take the sufferings. And we will. We will have a cross. But you see, he says, but to sit on my right hand and my left hand, it's not for me to say. It will be given to them of whom it was prepared of my Father. So you can't change your stature. I can't say, well, I'm called a teacher. I hope I, hope I can be a good teacher and, and, and graduate and eventually graduate to become a prophet. No, I can't do that. I'm a teacher from the foundation of the world. My status is teacher. There I am in the hierarchy of the body of Christ. Teacher, I didn't seek it. I didn't pro- proclaim it. I didn't study for it. God said, that's what you are. You're a teacher. That's it. You won't be any more. You won't be any less. That's what you are. Because God gave it to me. God called me that. And everybody is like that. And it's like that with your financial stature. You can't add. You can't take away. So here's my point. Let's say, oh, I'm a little deceitful and I charge the guy too much money. I charge him $1,000 because, oh, covetous, I was a little afraid that, uh, gee, I don't want to be left without, and I don't know, the job prospects don't look good for the future. I better charge him a little more so I have something to fall back on in the future. And let's say that's a breach of faith. Let's say I'm doing that because I don't trust God and I'm trying to make my own security. Let's say it's a breach of faith. And, and I get the money. I get the extra $1,000. And God says, oh, he's a thousand dollars higher than the stature I ordained for him. Uh-oh. Watch watch it. The next day I'll run over a bunch of nails yep. and I'll blow my tires and it'll take me a thousand dollars to fix it. <laughs> so what did I accomplish? <laughs> you see my point? Now it's kind of a simplistic um, example. But again, I'm, and, and it may not be perfect, but it makes the point. Ultimately, God's going to have you where basically God wants you to be. Right. And you can try to alter it. And you may even alter it for a season, or you may do this and you may do that. If God decides he wants you in a certain status, that's where you're going to be. Right. So it's incentive not to spend too much effort on those things, especially in the things pertaining to this life. But as we know, the prosperity preachers, when do they ever talk about sin and getting right with God and working out your salvation and the baptism of sufferings and uh, letting the old man be crucified and died and putting on the new man and getting ready to meet God and many people enter and try to enter and they won't be able to. No, they don't talk about that. They just That's just the prosperity. Oh, sow a seed and you'll get a seed. You know, sow, a, sow a dollar and you'll get a thousand dollars. Well, we all know that what you sow, you don't reap what you sow, right? You sow, you sow seed. You sow a kernel of corn and you get back you get back the corn. You don't get you, you don't sow a seed and get seeds back. You get the corn back. It's this whole sowing money and getting money. Anyway, we all know that's a flawed uh, doctrine. They with feigned words shall make merchandise of you. They, there's no there's no emphasis or not enough on the uh, eternal purpose of God. So back to what this is vanity. If, it, if you think of it in terms of this life, it's vanity. What am I doing going out there and laboring and bereaving my soul of good so I can work out there? What's it all about? Well, it may be worth, it may be nothing except teaching me about the vanity of life, right? Getting me vexed and frustrated. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be, and we're so, so we're supposed to find ourselves as Christians preparing to meet God, preparing, preparing to meet God, is that our old nature is, is a flawed nature. It's an, it's an iniquitous nature. It's an antichrist nature. It, the old man, he is not, he's a carnal mind. The carnal mind's an enmity with God. It, it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. The old nature cannot be righteous. So therefore, the only remedy for the old man is not to change him or reform him, is but is to kill him. Not physically, 
but have the nature, the inner nature of the old man based on hopes in this life, hope on getting my own happiness, hope on get, fulfilling the pride of life, and trying, all that stuff has to die off in, in your soul. It has to die. It can't be reformed. It has to die. And then when, it, when you die out inside, then you have an emptiness in your soul, but you have a room in your soul yes. for the new man Amen. to come forth. Absolutely. So it's the death of the old man, replace him with the life of the new man, Glory. and that's the process. It's the old man slowly, slowly is dying. The things you hope for and trying to get out of life, the pursuits, the things that you were struggling for and for happiness and contentment uh, in this life only, they're dying off, they're dying off. You're seeing the vanity of it. It doesn't satisfy me anyway. I don't care anymore. I go around sometimes saying, I don't care. I don't care about this. I don't care about that. I don't care if their hotels burn down. I don't care if the solar panels burn, burn up. I don't care of this. I don't care of that. And I'm, I'm not saying that my attitude of not caring, it, it's not always right. It's not always right. It's not like it goes over the edge. But what it is, it's an, an indication that my old man is dying. He doesn't care anymore. You understand? He doesn't care anymore. And that's what God's after. Another way we see it is the fire of God. God puts fire or affliction. Affliction can be likened unto fire. And fire heats up. And of course, within us is a good thing that God planted in us, but the old nature is in there too. Now, when we are saved, Christ, like as I said before, Christ dwells in our hearts by faith, and Christ become, begins to form within us and eventually come forth into us. It's, it's a cultivated thing. It's a progressive thing, something we pursue. Christ comes forth in us. But in that process, the fire of God, uh, so the old man is the dross, and the new man is the gold. And it's kind of like intermingled in there. There's two things in there at the same time. It's like Jacob and Esau were struggling in the womb. Jacob represents the righteous man and Esau represents the old-natured man, the evil man who will sell out his, his whole status with God for some little pleasure in this life or something that's meaningless. Esau sold his birthright for one little morsel. That's the perverse, perverseness of the old man. He has to die. So... You have uh, the fire of God. What it does is it begins to melt your soul, melt it in trouble, melt it in anxiety, melting it in anguish, melting it down with vexation and frustration. You feel the heat. And in that part of the operation of God, the uh, old man begins to separate from the new man. And the dross rises to the top. And you may see some pretty ugly manifestations in people as the dross comes to the top, it's being manifested. But it's being manifested so God can skim it off the top and get it right out of you. Now, I'm only speaking from personal experiences. A lot of you haven't seen the, the dramatic and, uh, say, the uglier part of uh, the old man, Jonathan, when he's vexed and uh, he's flying off the handle or he's uh, manifesting this or that. My only consolation is that I understand the operation of God and I can recover myself eventually and say, that's the old man. Okay, that's the old man. Thank God he's. Thank God I'm in the fire and he's being manifested and the dross is coming to the top. And then other brothers will tell me, boy, Jonathan, you know, compared to about three months ago, all this stuff went wrong on the job and boy, you took it pretty well. It didn't seem to phase you at all. Whereas a couple of months ago, you would have get all in a frustrated and tizzy and everything else. Well, that's because the fire is beginning to do its work. I'm dying out. To, I don't care. No man. You don't want to care too much about the things of this life. And that's what most of us do. We ascribe too much importance to the things of this life. So part of the operation of God then is the uh, for the old man to be crucified. And I'm going to review that a little bit. Remember, the old man is can't be changed, reformed, trained. He, he has to die. He has to die. And that's the process we're in. And our whole life is preparing 
to meet God. That's In a nutshell, that's all it is. Prepare to meet God. And you have faith in Jesus Christ. Your faith in Jesus Christ has to start, it has to start with faith in the resurrection from the dead and then go from there. Otherwise, you're, you have faith for Christ to help you fulfill things in this life but you're not thinking about the resurrection or pre- preparing to meet God. You're not thinking about all of that. Your faith is in vain. Isn't that what Paul said? If Christ be not risen, if your faith is not based on the resurrection of Christ from the dead to overcome the disappointments of this life and the deaths, deaths of this life, whether it's death in the heart or death of the flesh, then your faith is in vain. And that's the uh, fundamental problem with the Prosperity preachers. It cultivates people to have hope in Christ in this life. And that's not what it's about. Christ doesn't care what you get in this life. See, and that Paul striving with the uh, Jews about circumcision and all these outward manifestations of law and, and everything else. Paul finally says, look, circumcision doesn't mean anything. Uncircumcision doesn't mean anything. Here's the only thing that matters. Have you become... A new creature. Amen. It's the only thing that matters. It doesn't matter if I have a thriving business and then I lose everything I have. Well, through it all, did it break me? Did it, did it cause me to come to God in anguish and brokenness, humility, asking God to deliver and save me and made me let go of my hopes in this life, made me stop trying to scramble to save my my life that I thought was important but really is not important at all. And then, then then, something was accomplished in my heart that God wanted accomplished. And God doesn't care if it costs $20 million. That's nothing to Him. He doesn't care what your loss is in this life. He who seeks to save his life is going to lose it. That is what's wrong with the American way and that is the error of saying that the Constitution is only describing the God-given inalienable rights that we all have. This, this is inaccurate. This is an inaccurate representation of Christianity and scriptural principles. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Brother, I'm not pursuing my happiness. Jesus Christ said fundamentally, if you're going to follow me, you're going to inherit eternal life, You pick up your cross. Deny yourself. Stop seeking your own. Stop seeking your happiness. Seek the welfare of your brother and your sister. Even Christ didn't please himself. He was rich, but he became poor so you could be saved. I can pursue my own happiness. And I'll die with a temporary happiness that passes away that I'll forget in a couple of years. I'll forget the... uh, the enthrallments and the euphoria and the pleasures and the whatever came from my uh, accomplishments and puffing up my sense of accomplishment and feeling good about it for a moment and then it all vanishes away and then I'll lose my soul. What are you going to get in exchange for your soul? What if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul? Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. Follow me. How does that jive with pursue your happiness? You have a right to pursue your happiness. Really? The U.S. Constitution and their so-called magnification of what they say is God-given inalienable rights, all it does is it just justifies the individual's pursuit of their own pleasure. It makes it, gives you the, gives it, gives you the illusion or the delusion that somehow that's what God, God's gift is to you. <laughs> Fundamentally, 180 degrees opposed to the fundamental call of Christianity. Jesus Christ, pick up your cross. Deny yourself. Don't seek your happiness, your life, your pleasure. And that is so fundamental. That has to be ingrained in the Christian. That's fundamental. If that's not established, that's not why you're a Christian, then you're going to seek to enter and you're not going to be able to. Is it any wonder many seek to enter and they won't be able to? The Christ, that uh, the Constitution and the American dream and the whole system and implementation of civil rights and liberties. Hey, remember, what do we have a right? What kind of right do we have? 
Really, we're born in sin, shaped in iniquity, sinned against God. God has right. God has power. God has the right. He has every right to just throw us into hell. But for, from His mercy and His goodness, He provided an opportunity of reconciliation. A way to work out your salvation. So we are ministers. We are ambassadors of Christ. And we beseech you in God's stead, as Paul said in Corinthians or somewhere. We beseech you in God's stead. Be reconciled to God. Or in other words, work this out with fear and trembling. Be reconciled. Use your life to be to prepare to meet God. And believe it can be accomplished. And believe it's as serious as it is. It's serious. That's what we want to maintain. And you hear lots of people kind of playing down the importance of holiness or playing down the importance of perfection. and But it's very important. It's not only important, it's the necessity. It's something we have to do. So what is your life? What's the purpose of life? Well, it's not to be a philanthropist. It's not to uh, leave your mark and uh, so that for generations to come, the Jonathan Kaiser Christian orphanages and ministry for poor, uh, hungry people in Ethiopia endures for generations to come. God doesn't want me to do any of that stuff. God doesn't even want me to have a music ministry or a deliverance ministry or this ministry or that ministry. There's only one ministry. Be reconciled to God and work this out. That's all it is. Just like there's not a bunch of churches. It's not this church or that church or Pentecostal, Catholic, whatever. There's only one body. There's only one name. There's only one church. There's only one identity. Um, Moses in the law, in the book of Hebrews, all these things about the law, it said uh, these were a shadow of things to come. You know, they built the tabernacle and then they had the holy place and then they had the holiest of holies where the high priest went in. These, these were a shadow of things to come. They all were witnessing about Christ, you know. So the tabernacle represents sort of the church, and then the holy place represents us, like we've come together now, we're in a holy place. And then if Christ comes in our midst and we get caught up into the Spirit in a pronounced way, we can actually go up into the holiest of holies, where Christ is. Christ is the high priest. He's sitting in the holiest of holies. It's just all, again, it's allegory. What the Hebrews says about all those things of the Old Testament, that uh, the law having a shadow, which was a shadow or sort of a reputation or sort of a dim image, sort of a shape, showing you the shape of things to come, but not the very image. So what is Christ? Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. So as Christians today, with the infilling of the Holy Ghost, with the divine nature placed directly inside of us, something the Old Testament people did not do, therefore they did not have power to, con to produce the very image of Christ in their flesh. They couldn't do it. They didn't have the indwelling. The Holy Ghost wasn't given because Christ wasn't yet glorified. God provided a better thing for us. He gave us power. Now the doctrine is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. The actual perfected divine nature is manifested in your mortal bodies. So that's, that's, a, that's a tall order, right? So it has to be Christ in us. can't be us, but it's Christ in us. So more was given to us, more is required. And that's what we're working out. Now all of that is uh, before that manifestation of the new nature the old one has to be destroyed, has, uh, or has to die. So like Jacob and Esau struggled in the womb, our old nature and our new natures are struggling in the womb. Uh, as the Bible says, uh, the, the house of Saul, Saul represents the uh, legal aspect, I, I'll say, and David represents the spiritual. Uh, and what we found was that... Uh, the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker as the house of David waxed stronger and stronger. So this is the thing. The old man in us, the old nature has to get weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. You have to see this life as less important, less important, less important. Not care so much about, about it. 
And then the new man gets stronger and stronger. Christ forms and gains strength in you. And when the old man perishes, the new man takes over, empowers you to live the righteous, holy life. By that point, you know it's not your righteousness, it's the righteousness of Christ. That's another message, and we've preached it many times. So I'm going to do a little review on the, uh, the idea of the crucifixion of the old man. All right, yeah. Second Corinthians 5, starting verse 14. The love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge, if one died for all, then, we were, then were we all dead. And that he died for all, or that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. See, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You're pursuing your own happiness, who are you living unto? You're living unto yourself. You do, you do not live life unto yourself, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing the trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation, uh, we then as ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. <clears throat> now Galatians six fourteen to 17, God forbid that I should glory, <clears throat> save in all the things that I accomplished in my ministry for the Lord. No, nope, doesn't say that. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we've got to learn as Christians. What do we glory in? We glory in tribulation, Romans chapter 5, for we glory in tribulation, because we know, we know what tribulation is doing, we're patience, experience, experience, hope, hope make, makes not ashamed, love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, we, we glory in the cross, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature, as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy and upon the Israel of God, Okay, now th back to this Constitution thing and what they say is liberty. The, uh, the, the precept, the perception, the concept of, of Christian liberty, Christ has come to set us free. And it's that you can't just leave the concept or the explanation of Christian liberty in such a simplistic form like, oh, Christ came to set us free. Stand fast in the liberty. Don't be entangled. Wherewith Christ has made you free. Don't be entangled with the yoke of bondage. Well, what is this concept of Christian liberty? The Constitution has perverted, reverted it into making people think you're free to pursue your own happiness, as I was, I was saying. Okay, and that's not the liberty Christ is, is talking about. But the, the uh, Constitution and rights, it justifies in the conscience of men, in the conscience of Americans, it's justifying the pursuit of pleasing yourself. And the pride of life. See, if I have a right, like the U.S. Constitution says, well, you have a right, John. Yeah, someone told me I have to do such as Well, you don't have to listen to them because you have a right. You have the power. You, it's your decision. They, they think that liberty is the the, uh, the the liberty is the power given to an individual to exercise their will in constant independence. I do what I want. I decide I want for my happiness, and you don't have a right to tell me to do otherwise. <laughs> now, you don't have to be a homosexual, but if I want to be a homosexual, you can't tell me I can't. Because I have a right. I can exercise my will in independence of how you exercise your will. And you just exercise your will the way you want. Well, that's the kind of the crux of American civil liberties. But what does that do? Since when does the exercise of an individual's will and in independence constitute submission to God? Because the whole basis of salvation is submitting to God. You don't have a right to exercise your will the way you want in independence. Because Lucifer did that. As soon as Lucifer exercised his will in independence from God, 
He was cast out of heaven. So the U.S. has cultivated iniquity with all of that. So what is the Christian liberty? The Christian liberty is when the Christian has a passionate desire to glorify God and manifest purity and holiness in his body so that the world can see Jesus through them, but he's trapped yet in a mystery of iniquity and he's, 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 he finds himself succumbing to certain evil deeds and practices and sins and he's trying not to, but he gets overwhelmed and he's overpowered by a higher spiritual force and he falls to those things and he cannot do the thing that he wants to do. So in other words, he is not at liberty to express the righteousness of God because the power of sin has him trapped. And he desires liberty from that power of sin so he can express the holiness of God. That's the liberty we're talking about. Liberty from the power of sin to demonstrate the purity and holiness of God. Not to do what you want. And that's, that's where the concept of liberty is become skewed in the in the world and chiefly in America. Yeah, there oh I have a right what's that saying? Oh I have power. I exist as an independent entity. I can exercise my will in independence with and, and not to be judged or influenced or imposed upon anybody else. Right? If you say, well, children have a right and this is how stupid and perverted it's getting in our generation. Well, you know, if, if, if I'm a, some 10-year-old child who's a, who's a boy decides that he thinks he's a girl, oh, and then the Constitution, are, are they going to say that they have a right, that 10-year-old child, to enter into a gender reassignment surgery and turn into a, a woman, and the parents have no say in it because they're a child and they have a right? And you hear all this stuff about abortion and women say, my body, my choice. What an evil. What a wickedness. A total, total depraved attitude cultivated by American civil liberties. Perversions of Christian liberty. They say it's a Christian nation. That's why God isn't saving America. America corrupted the, all, all the concepts of Christianity like that. Now, there's some, I'm sure there's some good Christian people left in America, but they're not the majority, I'll tell you that. They're not Jerry Falwell's moral majority. I'll tell you that much. So let's, I'll read the scriptures. I did say it, but I'll read them quickly. If any man will come after me, let him pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, because that's what God gave, that's God's gift to you. No, no, no. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Prepare to suffer. Arm yourself with the mind. Renew yourself in this council here. We only have one one real driving issue in life. Prepare. Everything's prepared to meet God. Whoever shall save his life shall. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall. Find it. What's a man profit if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the, son of, when, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. Not according to his beliefs, not according to his philosophies of life or anything. He will reward every man according to his works. What what did your flesh produce? What fruit? What works? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that we may receive the things done in our body, whether it's good or whether it's evil. When he called the people unto him with his disciples, he said, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The same thing. It's a different, in a different gospel. Romans 15 exhorts the strong spiritual people. Read them that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Stop pursuing your own happiness. Try to do what's... Look not every man on his own things, but on the things of others let uh, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good for his edification for even Christ pleased not himself but as it's written reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me and I read this if in this life only we have hope in Christ we are of all men most miserable because if you follow Christ the emphasis is on 
eternal life, not on this life. Absolutely. You're giving up this life for eternal life. 100%. You're going to lose in this life to gain eternal life. Yes. But if we have hope to gain and be successful in this life, and that's all we have, yes. and we're saved, we're putting our hope in Christ, Christ is going to try to lead us into where we lose, we lose all that stuff. Yes. And we're trying to save it, yes. and we're hoping Christ will help us to save life, increase my... Uh, um, my career, my ambition, my goal, my dreams. You hear people, the, the spirit of the world talks like that all of the time. I'm so glad that God helped me to realize my dreams. Oh, it's been my lifelong dream to be a this and be a that and to get a business or get married and whatever. No, that's not what Christianity is. Now, here's the thing. Another fundamental principle that you should always put in your thoughts as you pursue things and go through life and your experiences with God. The things that are highly esteemed among men are abomination, abomination to God. Yes. So everything the way the world sees it, now this isn't, I'm not going to say this as an absolute, but as for the most part, and you'll see it quite often, more often than not, that However it exists or has status or reputation in the world, to God it would be exactly the opposite. So the people who, and I'm going to, so to illustrate it is the, is the rich man and Lazarus. I'll, I'll read it very quickly. So a certain beggar named Lazarus laid at his gate full of sores. He desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came licked the sores. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torment, seeing Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember, thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now, he is comforted and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that will come from thence. And they said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wilt send him to my father's house for I have five brethren that I may testify unto them that they also come, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham says, Nay, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, Nay, Father Abraham, if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Well, what's the point? The point is, Lazarus had his trials, tribulations, afflictions, sores, poverty, anguish, and then he lost his life. And so... And the rich man fared sumptuously every day. He had his pleasure. He had his comfort. He had his contentment. He had his fulfillments. And then they die. What happened? 180 degree opposite. See, save your life, lose it. Lose your life, save it. And they shall come from the east and the west and the north and the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are last which shall be first and there are first which shall be last. So what, do you, what, do you, what would you see when you see... Uh, uh, now, everybody here knows uh, a brother that we, that we knew at the farm, Jim, Jim Colossius. was very, very, very feeble-minded, yeah. kind of a, almost... Some people would almost say he's retarded. He's low. He's base. He's, you know, he's just. And the Bible says, you see your calling, brethren. Not many mighty, not many wise, not many noble. God has chosen the foolish things. God chose the base things of the world. The things that are despised, rejected. The rejects. The retards. The things that the world scoffs and scorns. and Says, ah, you're a useless eater. That's the New World Order would call it. You're good for nothing. You're just a feeble-minded nothing. God chose the foolish things to confound the wise. So, why? Because when God is glorified in them, there's going to be such a contrast that you're going to know it's God. It's going to be very obvious. So those feeble ones, 
those weaker ones, uh, we bestow the more abundant honor on them. They, they, they are more important because the, the God, it's easier for God to get glory in them because the contrast is much more obvious. You know, if, if, if God was going to bestow upon me, uh, if, if I could put a, 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 a figure on it, a level of intelligence of 40 million something or others, whatever the unit would be. God was going to bless me with 40 million units of spirit uh, of knowledge. And I was so smart, I was already at 38 million, just on my own efforts, 38 million units of knowledge. God gives me the extra 2 million. Hardly, ever, hardly anybody would know. Because I'm really not that much more smart than what... I don't know. I'm, it's just, it's just a, my desperate attempt <laughs> off the cuff here to show you the contrast is what glorifies God. Yeah. The low ones are, are, are the ones that are important to God. So the last shall be first, the first shall be last. So can you see on Judgment Day, God highly exalts a guy like him? Sure. And he's sitting in a position of judgment. He's sitting as a judge with Jesus Christ. God highly exalts that low-life, feeble-minded, retarded guy. Highly exalts him. And then you have, uh, oh, I don't know, Joe Biden or Xi Jinping on the bottom of the heap. And this, this, this uh, feeble-minded guy is, is judging the kings of the earth and declaring their sentence. See, the last are first, the first are last. God flips everything around. We were saying this before. When people get too haughty and high and when God puts them in elevated positions and, and things, and we all got to watch this, uh, the pair of Hannah was taught no more proudly, so exceeding arrogantly and proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, because the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. Yeah. And then it, she goes on to say the prayer of Hannah, and it's echoed in the Psalms and other places uh, that you know He can take the uh, He can take the uh, flourishing land and turn it into a wilderness, desolate wilderness. Now He can took, take a w desolate wilderness and and put a river in there and turn it into a flourishing thing. The, the hungry, the, the full have hired themselves out for bread. And the poor he has exalted. You know, he, he can just take, take, take the low things and exalt it and take the high things and cast it down and he can just flip the whole thing. If you forget that it's God doing all this, <laughs> he'll just flip it, all, flip it on you. And he can do it like that, you know. Well, here you have here you have Lazarus and the rich man. See, you want your you want all your goods in this life, you're going to lose it eternally. But if you lose it in this life, you gain it eternally. Just a simple principle. Yeah. It's not that God is never going to give us something in this life. Sometimes God will give you a blessing Absolutely. in this life. He may do that. Yeah. But it's just uh, just to this, this these principles are so that we we're not discouraged to seek them. And then we're not discouraged when we don't always get them in this life. That doesn't mean you have to be discouraged. Keep praising the Lord. Just because you didn't get your house, your car, your healing, your whatever. Just keep trusting God. Amen. Job said, I think it was Job, or was it the Psalms? I don't know. doesn't matter. My times are in your hand. Amen. To everything there is a time. There's a purpose and there's a time. So there's a time. There is a appointed time when God will deliver me from my angry, frustrated outbursts. Or there is a appointed time when God will deliver me from uh, my cigarette addiction. There is an appointed time that God will heal me of whatever. There's an appointed time. And all the days of my appointed time on the earth... I will wait until that change comes. Amen. And if it's not there, look at all the examples. Did discourage David ultimately did it. The, the old there fig tree does not blossom. Although it be not so with my house, although it hasn't happened yet, and I'm not sure I understand exactly why, I'll still trust God. Yes. I'll still believe there's a day appointed. Yes. And then again, what if you die in your faith and not receive the promise? You're better off Better with a better resurrection and showing God that you have patience, that your faith has been tried and you stay true to God in your trial. 
You know, blessed are they who have not seen and still. What do you think has more value to God? The guy who believes. I believe because I got healed. See, ooh, I can dance. And... Right. Well, my hip was all out of joint, and God created a new hip, and I can. Oh, oh what about the guy whose hip never gets healed, and uh, but trusts God all the way? Blessed is he who has not seen or not received the promise, but still believes. So that's that has value with God. I've said that to God many times. Well, so I heard this man and he he saw a woman healed and da da da. I read all these people have visitations from angels and so this guy's caught up and he even saw the Lord in heaven and what? Why can't I have one of those? <laughs> well, and, and inevitably I get the scripture: "Blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe." That's actually a better status. God's more impressed with that. Not that we're trying to impress God, I'm just saying. It's nothing to you that you have to be discouraged about. For unto you it is given to behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Somewhere in the Christian life, His love, His passion, His desire for God, loving Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, wanting to see God glorified, want to see purity and holiness manifested, and pursuing it and trying to uh, let your life manifest those things. You struggle with sin in the flesh. You struggle with the old nature. As I said, you can find ourselves in the Romans 7, 7 condition where we want to do good, but evil is present. We're overpowered, overwhelmed by sin, and we don't always, we're not always successful. And it should produce a cry in us. But in other words, we're trying to let the old man die. And we're trying to crucify him. We're trying to not let him have his way in our mortal bodies. And when you do that, you put yourself into a conflict. You put yourself into suffering. Because everything, everything, whether spiritual or physical, animal, everything fights for life. Everything wants its life. Everything's fighting. So if you try to deny that old nature what it wants to do in your flesh, it's going to fight you. It's going to try to press you to do it anyway. That's the nature of sin, the nature of the Antichrist nature in you. Now, when the Bible says we crucify the old man, they that are Christ have crucified the old man with its affections and lusts. Crucifixion is a process, it's not instant. The Bible says, Cursed is every man that hangs on a tree. Christ was hung on the tree. Yes. Cursed is every man that hangs on a tree. The flesh is the tree. Jesus makes spittle and anoints the man's eyes and he sees cloudy and then he says, what do you see? I see men as trees walking. Isaiah said, you are the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Your flesh is a tree. The tree produces fruit. So we're trees. So the tree is the flesh. Crucify the old man means when the old man wants a pleasure, wants to please himself, wants to do something that does not constitute worshiping God, then you crucify Him. You hang Him on the tree. In Jesus, they hung Him on a tree. Take your old desire that's ungodly, that's unprofitable, that's self-centered, selfish, and you hang it up unfulfilled. You say, no, I'm not going to fulfill that. No, I'm not going to eat four pieces of apple pie. I'm only going to have one and that's it. I know you want, old man, you want four of them. But that's gluttonous. That doesn't glorify God. I will hang that desire up on the tree. You hang it up. Unfulfilled. Unclean spirit comes out of a man. He goes through dry places seeking rest, finding none. He's tormented. Why? Because he doesn't have a body to fulfill, fulfill his evil. So he's tormented if he can't fulfill something in a body. You, you hang that ungodly desire up on the tree, you'll begin, you'll begin to feel the torment of that. He'll, he'll, he'll press to get, no, no, you want another piece of pie. No, you want another cigarette. No, you want another whatever it is. It is yeah. So it's to fight you. And what happens is you hang that thing, undesi- uh, that desire unfulfilled, and he begins to press you. Yeah. That old nature, the devil, sin, whatever, sin in you. And now you're in a conflict. So you have uh, Satan's nature, sin, the nature of sin, the spirit of sin, the spirit of Antichrist. 
And we, I often talk about the, the scripture in Deuteronomy. As a, there's a, a woman betrothed to a man in the field and a, a woman betrothed, a man forces her in the field. And uh, the man that forced her shall be put to death, but the woman, there's no sin in her worthy of death for she, the man forced her and she was in the field and she cried out. But because she was in the field, there was no one to, to save her. And this, this represents the devil or the nature of Antichrist, the devil trying to overwhelm you and overpower you with desires and things that are ungodly and f- trying to force you, force your flesh to manifest Antichrist nature. And you get overpowered and overwhelmed and overcome and you succumb to it. Now, if you are in the world or if your heart hasn't had the opportunity to have been converted, then there's provision for that. But, I mean, you can't willfully sin. You can't provisionally sin. But, uh, that's a whole, again, that's another uh, topic. You're, you're overwhelmed by it. So, but, okay, what I, the point I'm getting at is that you, you put yourself into a fight, a conflict with sin. The other way I, I put this is, uh, like the Bible says, that uh, talks about the Christians being sheep and the lost being goats. And then, then Paul also says that the unsaved are like the dogs, right? Beware of dogs. The unsaved are like the dogs. Well, as I was saying last week, we may think that we have an exercise of our will and we may think we're in control of our own destiny, but really we're not. We're being influenced in subtle ways that we don't realize by higher powers, Satan or Christ. And they are working and they they are able through uh, to to work in us to will to, to will and do certain things. So actually when I'm, when we're unsaved or we're in an unconverted state in any area of our hearts, we're, we're still hot, we still have the dog nature. And we're like dogs on a leash. And the sin or the devil has us on a leash. And he pulls us to do this ungodly thing or pulls us to do that ungodly thing. Now, if I'm walking hand in hand, if I take my dog for a walk and I have a dog on a leash and the dog is very obedient and does whatever I say, and turns wherever I turn, goes wherever I go. I have the dog on the leash, but there's no conflict in the dog right. because there's all kinds of slack in the leash. Oh, right? Dog's yeah. obedient. Yes. Okay? So the devil says, smoke a cigarette? Okay, I'll smoke one. Smoke another one? Okay, I'll smoke another one. Right. Have a beer? Okay, I'll have a beer. Have a shot of whiskey? Okay. Have another one? Okay. I just freely go along with whatever he does. Then... There's no slack in my chain, right? Do I feel any conflict or pain or anything? No, because I'm walking with my master freely. So you're chained to certain activities and sinful activities and attitudes and everything else. If you just just go along with the devil freely, you you may not feel any. You may, you may feel fine. You may feel like, oh, I don't feel bad about drinking this beer or doing this or doing that. But if God says, pursue holiness crucify the old man, right. hang him up on the tree, yeah. then what happens is the devil's going to try to get you to right. drink your beer and and you're saying, well, you know, God doesn't want me to do that or whatever, so I will, won't do that. I'll go the other way. Right. There's a separation between you and your old, old master there. Right. The slack gets taken up in your chain and you begin to feel the choke. Sure. And the devil's going to try to pull you back into that activity. Now, you're in a conflict. What do you feel? You feel pain. You're in a conflict. Now, this is what we said. God has certain provisions to maintain us in grace when we slip and stumble and fall and everything. But the thing is, are you trying to crucify the old man? Did you, did you just like your sin and you have a whole bunch of slack in your chain? Or are you in this conflict? God can, can forgive sin. But somewhere, as we crucify the old man... We're going to have to find ourselves in a conflict. And everybody gets into this conflict. And while you're in that conflict, you learn that sin is a higher power than you and you, you realize that you really need God's deliverance. And again, that's another message. But the crucifying of the old man, you want to look at it? That's, that's how it starts. Your pursuit of holiness starts with an acknowledging of the truth, with a very strong conviction 
you're convinced and, and, and persuade, persuaded and you have a strong desire to manifest God's holiness and when you recognize something that is not God's holiness, you crucify it. In other words, you hang it up in your flesh unfulfilled. Of course, that's not the end of the story. You're going to enter into a conflict. But as I say, where is the cry? If you say God is forgiving me of my sins and everything else, and uh, that's one thing. But uh, if you're just sinning freely, provisionally, loving your sin, you know, there's no... There's no, nothing in you that cares about the importance of perfecting Christ in your flesh. Then you haven't really hung that man on the tree yet. That's right. Now I'm not saying that righteousness can come just because you decide to be righteous. Righteousness can't come from simply the self-will of a man. But where this thing starts is you hanging the desire up unfulfilled on the tree. That's the beginning of crucifying the old man. From that point onward, you're going to have a conflict and you're going to have a rustling match and you're going to have pain and anguish. A cry is going to come into your heart and you're going to cry out to God because you're doing things that you really know that you don't want to do or shouldn't do. and You're going to have this whole struggle. But through it all, you'll learn about God's mercy, grace. You'll learn about your own dependency uh, on God so that when He delivers you and gives you His righteousness, through your previous struggles, you'll realize that that righteousness is not something you could do just simply by yourself. But you have to enter the conflict. Therefore, woe to them that are, woe to them that are at ease in Zion. We're not supposed to be at ease. We're supposed to be in a war, a conflict, a struggle. The old man has to be crucified. Unto you is given the behalf of Christ not only to believe but to suffer for His name's sake having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. We all have this conflict. You know, I've heard people go around saying, <laughs> I can sin because God, God forgives me for my sin even before I even commit it. With a gloat and a smile on their face. Well, there's no conflict there. There's no anguish. There's no cry to be delivered from evil. There's no passion to see the holiness and purity of Christ manifested in them. They haven't even tried to hang up their desires for Christ's sake. They haven't even tried to. They're just presuming on the grace, delighting that the sin will be forgiven before they even can commit it, anticipating that they can strive towards the sin. So you want a way? You want a simple way to define, uh, you know, when is sin an offense to God, and when it isn't, <laughs> or what well, when God will forgive sin, and, or when He's really, really very displeased with it. You know, I've characterized it this way: great, the grace of God is is there. But the grace of God teaches you to deny the ungodliness and the worldly lusts. Yes. Right? Yes. Live soberly, righteously, godly in this world. And does the grace of God give you permission to deliberately strive towards your sin? Not at all. No. That's, that's a characteristic of someone who loves darkness rather than light, yeah. who is perverting and transgressing grace itself. They feel at liberty to deliberately strive towards their sin. Right? Make no provision for the lust of the flesh. Don't provide the occasion for it. That's one thing. So any any time, all the time, every time, at all times. What does the Bible tell us to do as Christians? You you are you're embracing holiness and purity and righteousness. Do you strive towards sin or do you strive against sin? How, when? When do you strive against sin? All the time. All the time. It doesn't mean that sin may not overpower you sometimes. But you see where the mindset starts? If your mindset isn't started there, you're, you're, you're transgressing grace itself. And that was my issue with people who are too loose in their sins. Whereas, you know, you want to say God will forgive you your sin, that's fine. But where is this? If, you, if, you, if you're claiming forgiveness, God forgives me for my sin, and you have no anguish, you have no torment, you have no cry, you have no strife, you have no struggle that you're going through, there's no conflict in you, devil's overpowering you, but you're not crying out. Yeah, the Bible even goes to that example I just used in Deuteronomy. Yeah, a damsel that's a virgin is betrothed, and a man forces her in the field. Wow. Right? And I said, the man shall be put to death because he forced her. Yeah, well, sin's going to be, Satan's going to be damned and punished because he's forcing his issues on the Christians. But the woman cried out. She cried out. No one was there to save her. Right. Then in another 
uh, in that same chapter, there's a man forces a woman in the field, but the woman doesn't cry out in the city. She doesn't cry out. She just goes along with it. Then they shall both be put to death. The man, because he forced her, and the woman, because she being in the city, she never cried out. You being in the church, strive to deliver, strive towards your sin, and you don't cry out. You just go right along with it. And of course, you, you don't suffer any pain in, or, or strife or anything because you're walking freely with your evil master. Right? It's like the dog obeying its master. There's no, there's all kinds of slack in the chain. Right? If you're freely walking with sin, you don't feel like you're in bondage. If I just com- continuously fulfill all the desires of the lust in the flesh, continually, as, as, as the desire of the flesh is presented to me, I fulfill it. And then I fulfill it. And I fulfill it. I'm keeping slack in my chain. I'm not feeling a whole lot of pain or conflict. I'm staying ahead of, of my master, so to speak. So this no also will just... Okay, so you get the idea about crucifying the old man and where that process starts. And the idea that when you do that, you enter into a conflict... The conflict produces some agony, some torment, some pain, some some distress, some tribulation, a war against sin, uh, anxiety about your status with God sometimes. And if you're not in that, you're not crucifying the old man. You haven't even started. So, this know in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be... Lovers of their own selves. And this is what we're saying. In modern times, the United States has done more to cultivate justifying men being lovers of their own selves or making men and women feel justified in pursuing their own pleasure more than other generations. That's why the U.S. concept of liberty is is not really Christian. It's based on a skewed, perverted idea of Christian liberty. Men be lovers of their own selves, covetous, bolsters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janice and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further. Their folly shall be made manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord shall deliver them out of them all. Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So it's got the fire of God. It melts your soul with trouble, stress, anguish, vexation, conflict. It's all God's process of separating sin from you and it rises to the top and then sin appears sin and then God deals with it and delivers you from it and then you don't when when you're through with this operation of God this baptism of affliction this fire mm-hmm. fiery trial then you don't you do not sin whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin he that doeth righteousness is of God. He that doeth not righteousness is of the devil. It's a kind of a cut and dried binary thing. It's not like the like, like the old man can improve along the way. No, the old man ain't improving. There's only one remedy. The old man dies. And the beginning of the death of the old man is you crucify him. Put him, hang up his desire unfulfilled on the tree. And don't carry any false expectations that uh, when you do that, the issue's over. It's not over. It's just begun. But that's your starting point. Various things happen in your affliction, in your struggles, striving against sin. And it should 
that whole process should produce an anguish and a cry deep in your heart that God understands. And when that cry comes out of your heart, that desperate cry, you desperately want the righteousness and purity of God and you're struggling so much and you don't, you feel so overwhelmed and overpowered and you're in anguish because it might, like I say, challenge your status with God and a great cry goes up before God. Um, what was that? Yeah. See, when Jesus went to the cross, was God impressed with the, all the, the physical sufferings and everything? You know, in Isaiah, I believe it's 53, right? Who has, who has believed every part? Isaiah 53. The Bible doesn't say that, uh, you know, God will see all the wounds on his back and be satisfied. What, what God really was impressed with. Now, I'm not saying those wounds were insignificant right. or that he didn't feel the pain. But what I'm saying is the real crux of the matter, what God was really interested in, is he shall see the travail of his soul and then he'll be satisfied. When God sees the anguish and the conflict in your soul, that conflict and cry and anguish of soul couldn't be in there unless you had a true desire to magnify the righteousness, the holiness, the purity of God. And you're finding yourself in a struggle, overpowered by the devil, and you can't seem to to get the upper hand. Therefore, you desperately need God's power to get rid of that power to give you the Christian liberty to live without sin. Not liberty to live for your happiness. Liberty to live without sin. And then, when you're not, when you're living without sin, you're living in the divine nature. When you're in the divine nature, the Lord is your shepherd. And you have no want, you have no need. You are full and complete and content in the Lord. And you are now at liberty to love your brother. Because you're no longer the old man in his torments, seeking your own comforts, seeking your own appeasements, seeking your own closures on events that went wrong in your life, seeking your own vengeance, seeking your own satisfaction. Now he's dead. Now you're, deliber- you're in the li- delivered into the liberty of the divine nature, a son of God. And you have no want with God. You're, you're provided for. You're clear. You're free. Then what, what's your liberty for then? For your brother. Lay down your life for your brother. That's what Christ did. He didn't please himself. You didn't think Christ wasn't at liberty? You don't think Christ could have just said, heck with you all, 12 legions of angels, wipe these guys out. I'm not going to no cross. He could have done that. Jesus, Peter, put up your sword. Do you not think that I can now presently call to heaven and get 12 legions of angels and get out of this mess? That always impressed me. He, the thought probably crossed his mind. Right? He was tempted in all points. You, you don't think the thought crossed his mind? You don't think for a moment Jesus said, God, I'd just like to wipe these guys out. They're so evil. I'm not saying, I'm not saying one way or another, but I'm saying in some way, shape, or form, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And that's the abundance of Jesus' heart. That's what he said to Peter. He had to be thinking about it. The thought had to have entered into his mind. Hey, you can call 12 legions of angels now and you can get out of this mess. Yeah, you see? And that's what we're always trying to do, right? Get out of the... It's not wrong to be tempted to resist sufferings and all of that, but anyway, God will help us. Okay, I went quite long, so I'm, that's it, I'm done.